Good morning, everybody. We are here to worship Almighty God, whose purposes are good, whose power sustains the world that he has made, the God who loves us, though we have failed in his service, the God who gave Jesus Christ for the life of the world, and who by his Holy Spirit leads us in his way. As we give thanks for his great works, we remember those who have lived and died in his service and in the service of others. We pray for all who suffer through war and are in need. We ask for his help and blessing that we may do his will and that the whole world may acknowledge him as Lord and King. Our first hymn in our hymn books is number 579, I vow to thee my country. So let us remember before God and commend to his sure keeping those who have died for their country in war, those whom we knew, those whose memory we treasure, and all who have lived and died in the service of mankind. St Mary's Chillingstone, the Great War, 1914 to 1918. George Brown, Fred Carr, Ernest Chandler, Francis Childs, Charles Coomber, William Coomber, Harry Cooper, Ernest Coolstock, Harry Coolstock. Charles Denton, Percy Everest, William Golder, John Graham Stewart, Geoffrey Gunnis, Harry Handlebury, Albert Huntley, Ernest Huntley, George Huntley, Sidney Huntley. George Inkpen, Leonard Knight, Sidney Marchant, Reginald Medhurst, Gerald Milburn, 
James Craig, Frank Sando, Ernest Smith, Walter Smith, Alec Theobald, James Venn, Robert Wallace, Harold Whitaker, Trevor Whitaker, William Whitelaw, and Harry Yeoman. And in the World War 1939 to 1945, Harold Bokes, Samuel Chapman, Lewis Lee, Edmund Mead Waldo, Robert Swaffer, William Watley. St Luke's Chillingstone Causeway, The Great War, 1914 to 1918. Geoffrey Ashmore, William Crossland, William Krauss, Horace Eads, John Everest, Sidney Everest, William Frost, Herbert Grubb, Montague Hewlett, Albert Gammon, Percy Parker, Victor Pittsfield, Sidney Pocock, Victor Reddy, James Richards, Alfred Sears, Arthur Warner, Mark Young. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We, we will remember them. them. And in a moment, we hope to go over to listen live on the radio to the Cenotaph in London uh, at 11 o'clock for, for the two-minute silence. Uh, but before that, we, if you'd like to be seated, the choir will sing an anthem called For the Fallen. <coughs>
Almighty and eternal God, from whose love in Christ we cannot be parted either by death or life, hear our prayers and thanksgivings for all whom we remember at this time. Fulfill in them the purpose of your love and bring us all with them to your eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So I'll ask us to stand in a minute, but uh, we'll go over to the cenotaph and see what's happening there. The ambassador of Nepal and the high commissioners from nearly 50 Commonwealth countries will fill the pavements to east, south and west. Representatives are here of the faith and belief communities they take their position behind the High Commissioners on the west side. to note that the balcony opposite blue velvet with a golden braid sash where Her Majesty has stood for the past few years will be empty. She has missed six other Remembrance Day services here at the Cenotaph. The reasons over time have included foreign trips and pregnancies. The military detachments coming to attention. Our royal party will be led today by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Vice Admiral Sir Tim Lawrence, His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent, Their Royal Highnesses the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, Her Royal Highness Princess Alexandra, the Honourable Lady Ogilvy. Walking towards me now, the Prince of Wales taking position on the north side of the cenotaph. Shall we stand? He's in the uniform of the Admiral of the Fleet, the Duke of Cambridge behind him, the Earl of Wessex, the Princess Royal, and the Duke of Kent. We're approaching the heart of our morning. The King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery will fire a solitary field gun in Horse Guards Parade, and as Big Ben strikes 11, the two-minute silence will begin.
last post sounded by the buglers of the Royal Marines. There were ten of them playing their white pith helmets, and now laying a wreath on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, has moved forward. He's on the top step now, on the north side of the cenotaph, taking careful steps backwards. Mm -hmm. Salutes. Eyes now down. He's now being handed his own wreath. Moving forward, it's adorned with white and red, and that is laid horizontally on the top step. Her Majesty's wreath is propped. Salutes again. Walks back to his position. Handed his wreath now, His Royal Highness the Duke of Cambridge. His uniform, squadron leader. Although it's a slight change to the order of service, before Fiona reads our reading to us and we sing our next hymn, we will have the act of penitence, which is on page three. Let us confess our sins to God, the sins of shortcomings of the world, our pride, our selfishness, our greed, our evil divisions and hatreds, we confess our share in what is wrong and our failure to seek and establish that peace which God wills for his children. And so as we think of that, we pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from our sins, Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we will sing our next hymn before Fiona reads to us. Number 165, O oh God, our help in ages past.
The reading is taken from Mark chapter 13, starting at verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we stand to sing our next hymn, 487.
right for the second Sunday before Advent, Remembrance Sunday. Heavenly Father, whose blessed Son was revealed to destroy the works of the devil and to make us the children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that we, having this hope, may purify ourselves even as he is pure that when he shall appear in power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's sit or kneel for our time of prayer. As this is a day of remembrance and reflection, we will pause at various times throughout our intercessions to remember those people and places that are important to us. Let us pray for peace for the world, for statesmen and rulers, that they may have wisdom to know and courage to do what is right. For all who work to improve international relations, that they may find the true way to reconcile people of different race, color and creed. and for men and women the world over, that they may have justice and freedom and live in security and peace. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear yeah. our prayer. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit, the peace which is founded on righteousness may be established through the whole world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer as a result of war. For the injured and disabled. For the mentally distressed. <coughs> and for those whose faith in God and people has been weakened or destroyed. For the homeless and refugees, for those who are hungry, and for those who have lost their livelihood and security. For those who mourn their dead, those who've lost husband or wife, children or parents, and especially for those who have no hope in Christ to sustain them in their grief. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing our next hymn now. Now thank we all our God, and I don't know about you, but I've been giving thanks for Alok Shum, the uh, government minister who's been um, 
trying to help the COP26 countries to agree on, on a positive and good outcome for this particular conference. Um, and I think he's done a, a great job with a very difficult situation. Anyway, now thank you all my dogs. Number 379. Well, in the last two weeks of COP26 in Glasgow, we've heard many warnings about the future of the planet. And thinking of the reading that was read to us by Fiona, Jesus warned about the destruction of the temple. And it came true 40 years later in 70 AD as a result of the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. And even in the temple, as they were being besieged, there were different Jewish groups fighting each other rather than the Romans as the temple fell, was burned to the ground. As a human race, we find it so hard to live together well. Only this week, there are migrants on the borders of Belarus and Poland. This week, more migrants crossed from France to Kent than any other week. There's been civil war in Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia. There's a risk of famine in Afghanistan. And global warming mean, means that there is more energy in our weather systems. Because if when you heat something, you, there's more energy in it in the whole system, physics. And this leads to floods because warmer air absorbs and drops more moisture. Global warming leads, obviously, to heat waves, to the heating of the ocean so that the coral dies off. It leads to fires, remember Greece, California, 
Australia, and even in Siberia. There are droughts which lead to crop failure, and that in turn leads to migration. That's been happening in Madagascar, in East Africa, and many countries in the Sahel region of Central Africa. And when climate changes for the worst, people compete with each other for the resources that are necessary for life. Do you remember the Janjaweed persecuting the people in Darfur? It's because they were fighting over land, because the desert had been encroaching. Human behaviour also can lead to trouble for the planet. Cutting down the rainforests in Brazil or Indonesia means less absorption of carbon dioxide, less wildlife habitat, and a reduction in biodiversity. And then other human factors, such as bad or cruel governments, such as in Afghanistan or Venezuela, Nicaragua and Myanmar, can lead to mass migration. Think of Cox's Bazaar. And of course, the independent struggles against oppressive regimes can lead to conflict. And so, over the years, members of the armed forces have been sent into very difficult situations of conflict. I remember as a teenager that my parents were in Aden, where, which was very dangerous. My father missed death by seconds on one occasion. And I remember our soldiers in Ireland, in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Well, the UK government's chief scientific advisor, Sir Patrick Balance, gave a warning this week. Climate change, he said, is a far bigger problem than coronavirus, and it's going to kill more people in the pandemic if changes are not made now. He stressed that although the role of science and technology was important, people shouldn't rely on science and technology alone to halt climate change. He said in the pandemic, it took a concerted worldwide effort to come up with vaccines and drug treatments, yes. But we have to understand that behavioural change is also necessary. And he said this is exactly the same for the climate crisis. I read recently, just this week, of a geography lecturer in the University of Cambridge called Amy Donovan. And she said this, reducing disaster risk means a whole creation perspective. People as a part of creation with a particular responsibility to God for it. There are environmental hazards such as the physical processes which are part of how the earth is created and sustained. We think of the production of new land through the work of volcanoes like La Palma in the Canary Islands. But of course environmental natural hazards are exacerbated by human actions. And big disaster losses of lives, livelihoods, properties, species, and the environment are primarily the result of human decisions, she says. Ultimately, she says, whilst our individual choices about consumption have a small effect, unless they're very widespread, they need to be accompanied by changes in regulation at national and international levels to reduce the environmental risk and economic inequality. And that's what they've been trying to do in COP26 in Glasgow this past fortnight. Christians have a responsibility, she says, to be politically engaged and to lobby for regulatory and policy shifts away from excessive consumption, punitive, punitive trade relations, environmental degradation and greenhouse emissions. Loving each other involves caring for the creation and for our neighbour, whether that is by limiting the impacts of climate change, protecting biodiversity or reducing poverty. And she says Christians have responsibilities towards the rest of creation and our failure to enact those responsibilities is also a failure to love those who suffer as a result. They may be spatially dif distant, but they are not relationally 
distant. And I'm thinking of those islanders who are saying, you know, if the sea level rises, we will just be submerged beneath the ocean. She said, Amy said, that we are called to reflect Christ by loving each other and his creation in this world, even if we anticipate its renewal in the next. We care about creation because it is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24. And of course, when we do care for creation, we're also demonstrating love for our neighbour. Now, just this week, I noticed that I'd hung some football... We'd had our grandchildren uh, a week ago, and I'd hung some of the football netting that had been used for goalposts over some chairs in our garden to dry off. And I suddenly saw this netting move as I was in the kitchen, and I thought, what's that? It's those wretched squirrels chewing the netting again. Well, it wasn't. When I got out there, it was a hedgehog. And it had gone through the netting and it got stuck. And you know the hedgehog spines go in a certain way so that the further it was trying to go in, the more it got stuck. And I thought, can I pull it out? And I couldn't. So I thought, I'm going to have to cut the net. So I cut the net, released the hedgehog, and my son came out and gave it some food it, and water because it had probably been there for a long time and we hadn't noticed it. Well, after it had curl, uncurled from its curled-up ball, uh, it did eventually move off. But you know what? The next morning, I was letting the chickens out, and what did I discover? In another net further round, the same hedgehog, well, I suppose it was the same hedgehog, was stuck again in the netting. So I had to cut it out again. Well, I think like the hedgehog in our garden, we need sometimes, well, we need God's help to extricate ourselves from some of the situations that we find ourselves in, often of our own making. But of course, it isn't just God who has to rescue us. We need to take action ourselves. And St. Paul said in Romans chapter 14, pursue or make every effort about what makes peace and mutual upbuilding. What makes for peace and mutual upbuilding? Pursue that. Make every effort to bring it about. So that's our part in relationships. And on this Sunday, of course, we're remembering many thousands of people, including those from our own families and communities, who've given their lives in an effort to try and bring about peace between nation and within nations. And as we thank God for their sacrifice, let us determine to be people of peace, living in peace with our friends and neighbours, and making every effort to bring healing to our broken relationships. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of all, govern the hearts and minds of those in authority and bring the families of the nations divided and torn apart by the ravages of sin to be subject to his just and gentle rule who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So now we stand to sing our next hymn, 365, Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
tribute bring ransomed healed restored forgiven who like me his precious sing standing, we offer to Almighty God our thanksgiving for the many blessings with which he has enriched our lives. We thank God for our Queen and her family and all under her who bear the responsibility of government. Thanks be to God. For those who serve in the armed forces of the Crown on sea, on land and in the air. Thanks be to God. For doctors, nurses, paramedics, rescue services, chaplains and all who minister to those in need or distress. Thanks be to God. For the unity of all people within the Commonwealth. Thanks be to God. For the sacrifices made especially in two world wars, whereby our peace has been preserved. Thanks be to God. For the Royal British Legion, thanks be to God. We sing the national anthem. God save us. Just queen. Let's sit or kneel for our final prayer. May God grant to the living grace. To the departed, rest. 
to the Church, the Queen, the Commonwealth, and all humanity, peace and concord. And to us and all his servants, life everlasting. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all this Remembrance Sunday and forevermore. Amen. And just before we finish our service, this afternoon at three o'clock, there will be an act of remembrance just outside the church at the War Memorial, and Sally Musson will lead that. And uh, just one advance notice, we have the Forum Choir coming to St. Mary's on the 4th of December at half past seven in the evening. And um, they've said to us that um, any monies raised from attending at the, com the, um, the choir evening, uh, any extra money will be given to St. Mary's and St. Luke's for, to restore our depleted funds after such a two-year uh, season of uh, COVID and other things. And of course, the reason that we're meeting in St. Mary's today is because the boiler has broken down totally in St. Luke's Church. So that's why we're here in St. Mary's until further notice. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Normally we have res refreshments after the service, but because of Remembrance Sunday, we've decided not to have that. So uh, there won't be any, but there will be normally. So as we finish our service, the choir will process out. <laughs>